Little was the thing that finally. Oh, sorry, finally, I've just forgotten to record. Yeah. Carry on. I think it was the title that finally um, brought it all together. So, Miracle. In supermarkets strapped in a trolley, on the motorway belted in the back of a car, under the founded houses, mouth, I'm sorry, open mouthed and fed by drips, in a box drilled with holes in the hold of a boat, in fish crates and on cardboard, on pallets and straw, on a bed of needles on the forest floor, in the curve of a rosy scarf tied to a woman's back, in a line of walkers along railway tracks, under a tarpaulin on mud and sand, a child is sleeping, a child is sleeping. And with that one, I got the idea, first of all, in Rome, um, I saw a woman, a heroin addict in the street with her baby in her arms in the street, but the baby was very contented and beautiful. And I couldn't get that image into the poem, though. It's one of those weird things. Yeah. And also I saw in a pottery shop, some people dipping their sleeping baby's feet in paint and printing the feet onto the plate. And I wanted to get that in, but I couldn't. And I think that that's quite a sort of middle class and privileged image. And probably that's why that couldn't go in, in a way. But it made me think about imprinting children and the positions they're put in. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of prepositions in that poem. So it had like a backbone of prepositions. And it's a bit like putting children somewhere, you know, you position them somewhere. So that's very simple. It took quite a lot of redrafting and thinking about to get it to that, that sort of point, which you might be interested in as writers. Um, the next one I'm going to read is called uh, Lines Prompted by an Old Leather Travel Bag. And just a note of explanation. My um, father, when he was dying in hospital said, last night I dreamt that once all fields had names. And in fact, in the village where we both came from, Selborne in Hampshire, um, they do have names and we both knew a lot of them. So we spent the evening trying to think what they were again. Um, I haven't put the names in, so that was a decision. Uh, he spent all his life in one village. I went to the same village school as him. We both played out, you know, him in the 1920s and 30s, me in the 1960s and 70s. And... Um, but he liked to travel a lot, so we did a lot of traveling. So I wanted to put into the poem this idea of traveling. But it's a poem about wanting to rescue someone from dying. And I brought into it a kind of metaphor of the village as a sheet, as if I could form the whole village into a sheet to cover him. And then at the end, maybe to drive up the car we used to drive all over Europe in on holiday. That's the leather travel bag which prompted uh, me to write the poem. Um, and kind of help him escape from the hospital before death got there. It's quite a metaphoric sort of poem, so that's why I like to explain a little bit about it. Lines prompted by an old leather travel bag. Knowing how he packed to a plan and how we'd wear what we could on the drive out, I gather up the village, fields and woods to make a shirt but lacking skill, I weave them into a sheet. The warp beech nuts flayed into thread, <clears throat> the weft a gleam of wild cherry bark rippling like the knuckle stream. In the ward, I fling the sheet over him. And when he moves, meadows bend their stems in shivers of poppy and vetch. Then restless, he flattens the grass with his weight, as cattle do before rain, on days when children curl up in the green bowl of a cow's warmth. Across him now the bosky track climbs to its goal, a day moon, a hole in the sky's slub of fraying trees. And when the map slips from him, I settle the woodland across his shoulders, while he shrugs off the tree light, saying, last night I dreamt that once all fields had names. I take his hand and place it on the sheet. See here, I say, as he clutches swathes of hay and lets them fall in switherings. 
I am garrulous as a jay, guessing at words, until one sigh summons another, and stubble quills whisper of ditches and styles, of green finches, and the small weight of lapwings landing. Where have they gone, he asks. When I fold back the sheet, paths and coppices drift from my fingers. In his dreams, he names fields. But in my dream, I twist hedgerows into a rope, lower him from the window into the ticking car, then rip field names from the unraveling sheet, zip them into the lining of the battered bag, map read its leather surface, and so we make our escape. Oh, thank, thanks for that. <laughs> the clapping's very nice, thank you. Um, I thought because that's quite a long poem, I'd, I'd read another one. I, I rather like um, metaphysical poetry where people create a, you know, a big conceit. I think one of my favorite poems is by John Donne, The Valediction on Weeping, and uh, how it sort of draws in his world into the metaphor. And I suppose that did inspire me in a way in writing that poem about my dad partly. Um, drawing in parts of his world and our world, the world we shared, uh, the world of nature in Selborne. Um, this is a short poem which I thought would follow well after listening to a long one. Uh, this is called Comfort and it's just about comfrey, uh, the plant, which gets its name from the word comfort. And in the poem too, there's knit bone and bruise work because I'm sure you know that com comfrey is supposed to have healing and soothing qualities if you, if you break a bone or if you bruise yourself. And I wrote it during lockdown, so it was partly about the anxiety that everybody was feeling and wishing that there could be something soothing in that time. Comfort. Where there is pain, a knocked arm, a bruised knee, search for knit bone, bruise wort, comfrey swayed by bees in a warm breeze, the mind longing for ease. So I think um, it sounds silly to say I work quite hard at getting the word, e the sound of the word ease in three times at the end, but I did because I wanted it to have this almost buzzing and calming sort of effect. Um, the next poem is called The Night Table. There's a very famous poem I'm sure you know called The Table by a Turkish poet called Edip Jean Savage. And he brings everything onto the table, the sky, the desire for a pint of beer, which actually meant this poem has been um, censored in Turkey because it mentions drinking alcohol, which is quite an interesting point about it. Um, but it's a wonderful poem, a bit more optimistic than mine, but uh, lots of people respond to the table by Edip Jan Savage, and I've responded and made it a more kind of female nighttime kind of operation. The night table. A woman who can't sleep puts the moon on the table in its halo of cloud, goes out to the garden to cut woodruff and jugs, and jugs a sheath of its tall stems for the table. She puts the agony of doing wrong on the table. She questions the meaning of three and puts her question on the table. She takes a torch and puzzles out wound wort in the wilderness of the hedge. In the kitchen, lit by the moon's lamp, she counts off red flowers. Wound wort, she says, healer of cuts, mender of skin, cure me now. <laughs> Even the marigolds close their faces to the dark. She pounds their orange petals with a pestle. Then she calls dawn to the table to sweep up the curled seed moons and scatter them onto a bed of earth. The woman prays for sleep and puts her prayer on the table. The table creaks. Um, <laughs> that poem and um, the comfrey and the next one I'm going to read, it all in a way came out of me running some poetry workshops at the Wealdon Downland Living Museum in Sussex years running and we looked at the buildings I think Christine was on one of them actually and um and it was rather nice for me to get some poems myself out of it 
and we thought about Whitaker's Cottages, which is a 19th century. But it, for those of you in America and so on, um, this is a, a living museum where they move old buildings into it to preserve them. And so that you can look around, so it's like an old mill, medieval cottages. It's the most wonderful space. Um, but they also have these 19th century cottages. And um, I also used to live in a, in a terrace of cottages once that were very basic. Um, with like a sort of more or less one up, one down really. And then I found out that the people who lived there once, there were like 10 of them living in that house. So it goes back to an old time when people had tin baths in front of the fire. Um, they had to keep their stoves going with coal. Um, and you were very aware of what went on through the party wall between the houses. So this poem is called Terrace Ghost. Neighbor. Did you hear my man smashing plates? <clears throat> or did the clatter of your tin bath mask the sound? Neighbor, did you press your ear to the wall as mine is now, listening to your water pour? That buckle is the coal bucket's rattle. That whistle is the kettle's breath. That fizz you hear, my iron on the sheets. That heavy slosh I hear, you lazing there. Neighbour, I'll stoke the stove if you'll rise dripping to lay your palm against the chimney's heat. There's something naughty going on in that one, I think. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, so my next one, so all of those really came out of the Wheel Down Line workshops. Now, the reason the, um, the collection is called The Conversation is because of a conversation I had with my friend Helen Dunmore, who was a wonderful novelist, short story, um, was a short story writer too, but mainly known for being a, a wonderful novelist and poet, and also um, a wonderful children's writer. She was a very productive writer, and her work has won all sorts of awards and prizes. And it was my great pleasure to be very closely, uh, have a very close, intimate friendship with her. And um, in the year before she died and just before she was diagnosed, I had a very long conversation with her in um, the Costa Cafe in Trafalgar Square in London. We came for coffee, we stayed for lunch and we stayed for tea and we left when it was dark. And um, then, uh, then, uh, then a couple of months later, we realized she had a terminal illness. And so I thought back to that amazing day of talk that we had where we stayed much longer than we intended. I love being in a cafe talking to another writer. Um, and uh, I was thinking about how poetry is a measure of time. You know, it's beaten out in rhythms, all poetic forms as we know are, are, are beats and rhythms, but the time is passing, um, keeping time. And I wanted to find a new language for time, which was a poetic language, the language of poetic forms. And then I also thought about how when you write a poem, you're trying to stop time in a way and hold it in a hold it in a kind of container, um, and it carries on, you know, because you can read poem, poems from the ancient Greeks and Romans that are fantastic, and they've kind of stopped time and contained it. So it's that paradox with poetry of time running on, measured out in beats of time, and the time passing was what really um, brought the poem together for me. The conversation which is also the title of the collection. And I hope it's about different conversations people have, but also about a conversation with nature or with grief or with survival. The conversation. Now our words need a new measure of time. Syllables for seconds, sonnets for minutes, epics for hours. This is our cafe society, as if the cafe will never close and the steps from the cafe will never tip us out onto Trafalgar Square to hurry across the wet stones with the gold of our talk glinting round our feet, the largesse of winter scattering our reflections into the tears of the fountain's mist, which falls and rises to the lit up windows gathering in the bare armed trees. There we are, leaving the coffee spoons and teaspoons on saucers, hurrying away to our separate evenings, walking out among the languages of the world, 
which find no true word for the talk of women. Unless, dear friend, I name our talk for you, a light that shimmers along city streets and out along the lanes of great souled hills. Some people say that the word guzzle or gazal, um, uh, which is a poetic form that this poem isn't in, uh, means the talk of women, but it doesn't seem to be certain. So therefore, I, but it reminded me of a, of a guzzle or a gazal. So I've coded Helen's name into the end. When you write one of those, you code your own, the meaning of your own name into the end. Um, and I've just written one that's on my website, actually, under my fundraising for the Claritans link, if you want to have a look at it. Um, but in this, and I code my own name into the end of that. But this one, um, I coded Helen's name in. So Helen means shining light, and um, Dunmore means some great hills. Or whatever. And I wanted to sort of commemorate her right into the root of the poem, I suppose. But no one would know that unless I actually explained it, which may or may not be a fault of the poem. Um, and this next one is for Helen as well. So between the, um, between the, her death and her funeral, we went to Cornwall for a week. Um, we spent a lot of time in Cornwall with Helen, you know, in separate houses, but having holidays at the same time in the same place. And this time we went to a different place in Cornwall because we couldn't bear to go to the same place, but it was very magical. It was tremendous weather. Um, and the village was putting on a community play. So when we went out into the cove, sometimes people just cropped up singing amongst the boats. Sometimes mermaids came in on, on rowing boats. And one particular time, a marionette giant, you know, a man underneath with huge paper wings, it was massive, was running along um, the, the, the edge of the um, cliff. And then we saw a sword fight and so on. And because we kept popping out of our accommodation and seeing this, it created an amazing magical feeling. Um, also at the pub, they brought out every day all the bones from the fish and the, um, I suppose bones from fish and bones from meat, which were the remnants of the meals. Um, and that also created a strange elemental feeling. So the woman would come out and throw up this bowl of stuff and the, all the gulls would sweep down and take it all away, take all the bones away, there was nothing left. Um, and it just felt like something very kind of fundamental or natural. And it all seemed tied up to me with my grief for Helen somehow. Now this is the kind of scene I could have talked to her about for a long time and she would have been interested, whereas other friends might not be interested in it, you know. Uh, so um, that was partly feeling there isn't, su there isn't that special person to tell about this, made me want to tell it in the poem. The Summoner of Birds. A rounded woman, her hair up in a sea colored net, wearing a blue dress, a white apron, carrying a bowl on her hip, walks out of now, walks out of time, walks out onto the pebbles, steps over the winch's chain to the wash of small waves to summon a gyre of gulls and their cries. She pauses where the stream pours into the sea, lifts the bowl from her hip, and in one curved move, flings knuckle bones, neck joints, spare ribs, arrows of sea bass, sole and cod into the air to drop in a moment's fall till snatched by the beaks of the gulls and carried up again while sandpipers pick the beach clean and the winch weighs down the scene. Then comes a winged giant along the todden, threatening death, but underneath an actor works his wings. Mostly what I miss in these soon after days is our talk, what I would have said what you would have made of this. The shadows of things, of gulls, of paper wings, of bones, play out on the harbour shore with one witness less. And now the woman in the blue dress picks up the empty bowl and returns to the inn. The giant folds his wings. Even with you gone, I shape this story and ask, what do you make of this? 
So, um, thanks. Uh, I've got one more I'll read, um, which seems quite weirdly topical today, actually, in some ways. Um, for a long time, again, a bit like with Miracle, I was collecting up all this information about soap. I was very interested in how it was made and the cultural significance of soap. And it is something that does unite different cultures. And the original soap seems to have come from very ancient Persia. Um, then I was thinking about Romans and Greeks and how they covered themselves with oil. They washed, but they have also would take olive oil and then wipe it off with a stone, you know, clean themselves up. Um, there's so much about it. And I must admit, I've forgotten a lot of my research now. That's what happens. I do a lot. I sit on it for a long time and then and then it kind of distills into the poem and then then I've then I've forgotten the detail of it. So I hope there's enough here to make it make sense. Um, uh, but it really came together, this poem. I could have written really a whole book about the soap, actually. It's a really good subject because it's very intimate. It touches our bodies. It keeps us healthy. It's also a pollutant and it creates, um, and it has a, a, a role in, um, in explosives as well. Um, it's not all good. Uh, I wanted it to be an epic subject, like um, Achilles' wrath is an epic subject in the Iliad. Sing, O Muse, the Wrath of Achilles. Um, but you could also sing something of soap in desperate times, in epic times, like we live through, through lockdown and pandemic. So that really, in a way, brought the poem together and I finished it in lockdown. Um, and then I realized also all sorts of personal things about soap and how I love getting the presents and how it's a very emotional subject, really, in the history of your own life. So this is the poem. Sing of soap in desperate times. In spite of palm plantations, felled rainforests and effluents, in spite of plastic dispensers, in spite of nitroglycerine, in spite of a name that categorizes lifelong dramas, the sing of soap is to sing Algali, wood ash that lends its name to alkali, to sing rainwater and to sing oils, olive, vegetable, sesame, and not to mourn an absence of tallow, for who wants to rub the fat of a cow on their skin? To sing some soap names, but not others, to sing pears, dove, and life boy, but not imperial leather, a name saddled with empire, whose legacy refuses to be washed down the bug hole. To sing of the soap my daughter gave me, nettle and seaweed, astringent shore, field margin, seawater, kelp, ribbon of nori. To sing soap is to sing my grandmother, lathering a slip of palm olive for skin and laundry and then to sing the green unrinsed forgetfulness, streaking her long white hair. To sing my sister's gift of a bar of soap is to sing a fourth dimension containing the bloom of two lavender bushes. To sing soap is to sing a child sifting pink stars through fingers in a bucket of water and soap work at the Living Museum. To sing soap was to choose on days when the French market still came to town from Les Savons de Marseille, Fenouille, Citron, or Mugue des Bois. To sing soap is to sing happy birthday twice, congratulating yourself like a prime minister, or to watch Gloria Gaynor washing her hands, singing, I will survive for 20 glorious seconds of being alive. That's it with my set. Thank you so much for listening. It's such a nice audience. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, let's unmute. You can all unmute. Um, thank you. That was absolutely uh, wonderful. I love, uh, I love the range um, of the poetry. And listening to your explanation and discussion afterwards mm. was fantastic to have that sort of insight of what your thought process had been and how you were planning and and working and weaving it all in so it was wonderful so thank, thank you. you so much we were really lucky stephanie norgate thank you thank you so much thank you very much, well, uh, thank you very much for listening so nice. <laughs> okay so i think i've got um everybody who wants to read i think i've got your names and if um 
if we get to the end and I've forgotten you, then shout at me loudly. Um, so the normal rules apply. Uh, I've got, actually, I'm gonna do some announcements now because I'll do it in the middle. We've got a lot, words out loud, we've got a lot going on as it turns out. So I'm gonna give you some chronological info about what we're doing. Some of that is on Zoom and some of it's um, in and around Chichester. So the next thing that's coming up on Sunday the 30th, which you've had an email about, is our Body Spe the Body Speaks workshop on Zoom. Um, and we've already done the workshop in, in person, um, but some of you from across the Atlantic had asked us to, to put it on, could we put it on Zoom? So we have. So if you haven't signed up or if you know your mates who want to sign up, then please get to look at the website and sign yourself up. It's on Eventbrite. Uh, Mike, do you want to say a little bit more about it? Because Mike is one of the, the leaders of the workshop. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, um, Ken. Yeah, so it'll be happening on Zoom. So it'll be a live workshop. Um, and Denny, who is often with us, but it's not here tonight, is also the other instructor. Um, and Denny will begin by um, introducing us to some techniques from um, the Alexander Technique. Um, uh, and the Alexander Technique was developed actually for um, solving the habits of how we hold our bodies in tension. It was developed, Alexander, where he was an actor and he lost his voice and in recovering it, he discovered this technique which is used for lots of different applications now. So that's quite difficult to do on Zoom because it's a very physical um, technique, but we'll do an introduction to that. And then we'll do some uh, voice exercises and we'll particularly be focusing on voice exercises and with text. Um, so to, again, in a way, disrupt our comfortable vocal habits. We often um, have comfortable vocal habits where we sit in places with our, our voice and tone and, and so on. Um, so it's a good fun workshop. Because it's on Zoom, we think we can really only probably have about eight people um, in total um, so that everybody gets a chance to read and work on the piece that they bring along. Mm. Um, so that's on on the 30th, I think it's a Sunday, the 30th of uh, January. Denny and I will actually be in the Wagtail studio together, connecting via Zoom and leading it from there. So please have a look at the website, wordsoutloud.org.uk. It's on the events page. Um, it's £25 per person. The workshop will last for two hours. Um, we're going to record it, and if the footage is any good, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we'll make the recording available for people to um, watch afterwards, and perhaps you know, we'll offer that for a very affordable price, like £5 or something, but we'll obviously seek everybody's consent to do that. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so that's The Body Speaks. Um, the next thing coming up, February the 2nd, is our in-person at Wagtail. February the 16th is our next Zoom, which features uh, Jane Metcalf. And if you have a, a look on the website, you'll see that Jane has had a really interesting and varied career, um, and uh, particularly in, in voice, um, is a singer and has taught uh, at the Guildhall um, Acting School, um, and she's got a, a whole range of stuff. So have a look. Um, February the 24th, uh, again, we're in person. That's at the Anchor Blur, the pub in Bosham. Some of you will know. Um, and that's our, um, uh, I don't know, our celebration of, of love, loving. Um, Valentine's Day, February's that sort of month. So we thought we'd theme the reading in the anchor um, around love and loving. So that's what's happening uh, then. Um, and lastly, I think uh, we ran last year, um, was the first year of running a competition, poetry competition with Wagtail. Um, so we're doing it again this year in conjunction with Wagtail. We'll be sending out emails again. It's gonna start, entries will be open from probably um, the beginning of February until the middle of March. Um, and there will be, those of you interested, there will be an overseas category. So um, 
there's an international, there's a prize for an international entry as well as the other um, entries and the other categories that we normally have. Um, we will be trying out later in February, well, so early in February, but we're going to try it out and see if it works. We're going to try and move the, make the Zoom, this Zoom into a hybrid um, event so that we have uh, some people in, in person in the cafe at Wagtail and others on Zoom. So we're going to do a, a, I guess, a proof of concept just to test for ourselves that we can make it work early in February and then so watch out we may be moving this to be a sort of hybrid event um, in the next month or so but we'll see we'll let you know so that's what's going on we've got quite a bit happening um, it's wonderful to see you all um, and we'll go now we'll start the open mic now as I've said to you before um, and you know um, the rules are one poem no epics, and I can switch you off. So, but I won't. And, and blame it on a technical fault. But I wouldn't do that. But, you know, I just wanted you to know I have that power. <laughs> That's all you need to know, really. So, um, if you're all ready, um, we will kick off the open mic. Oh, um, I'll mute you all, and then we'll kick off the open mic with... I think we'll kick off tonight with Tina McNaughton, Tina Mack. Unmute yourself, please, and let's go. Hi, everyone. This is a poem that I, I don't even know if it's really a poem. I literally scribbled it down when I came back from my walk this afternoon. So I'm taking a chance. I could make a total fool of myself, but I'm going to go for it. It's called Walking with a Volley on a Wet Wednesday Afternoon. Walking with a volley on a wet Wednesday afternoon with the slight worry that a poem has not come my way for a while. I notice the fallen dead leaves as I pound the pavement as energetically as I can manage on a slow January day. Workmen sing loudly as I pass, vying for the attention of a passing female until they notice the strands of grey escaping my purple beret. I see one of them look away quickly, embarrassed, probably remembering grandma, I expect. Still, I managed half a glance, not bad under the cloak of 50 plus. The cloak was unprepared for, but not wholly unexpected, I guess. A passing pedestrian steps aside to let me pass. A bonus, I guess. Grandma says thank you and smiles. On my return home, I fetch my pad and scribble furiously. I note that my favourite novels do not always tell a story. And my favourite lines and rhymes are sometimes about absolutely nothing. I write some more and I feel happier. <laughs> it's a bit of a silly one. Wonderful. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. OK, um, now it just takes me a minute now because I've got to unpin you and then pin somebody else. So it's all Mike's fault that I'm taking longer, but we don't mind. Uh, next up, please, let's have Holly. Hello. Uh, can you unmute? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I just unmuted, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Um, this is um sort of a, a, a poem perhaps prose um it's about um it doesn't have a title um it's about a bench at west dean which is a place not far from chichester for those of you in america and it's a place um i love to go um very often and it has a lovely cafe with good cakes as well so this is um bench at west dean there is a place not far from where I live, where I like to sit and gaze upon the world. A wooden bench, large enough for three, is waiting patiently just for me. And together we shelter beneath an apple tree whose dark green leaves hide branches laden with fruit. 
The grass beneath my bare feet is sunburnt brown and dry, prickly against my skin. The ground slopes down to a stream, still running despite the fierce long summer days. The clear water flying over a bed of clean stones, pulling pale green weed in its wake. Across the stream is a field rising gently to a wood, and if I close my eyes slightly, all I see are shades of colour, dark green in the distance, pale nearby, yellow in the sunlight, black shadows beneath single trees like pools of pitch, and black crows fly low, sunlight on their back calling hoarsely to each other. Above, two kites, wheeling slowly, wings spread wide, feather tips lifting, and higher still, screeching as they tear through the air, the harrier jets of summer, swifts, boomerang silhouettes, darting, weaving, playing catch with hapless bluebottles, as they race in pure distilled joy. <laughs> Lovely Holly, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Next up, please. I think we'll invite uh everybody's still here. Piers, are you there? You are, I see you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, continue with my saga. So, it, but I'm only only doing three pages out of it. It's called Road Trip Isfahan, uh, 1969, uh, when myself and Annabelle drove out to Persia to a Bronze Age dig at a place called Babajan, and I read you the first few pages last time. And I'm um, now published it, self-published, I have to say. Uh, it's in a book called Onwards, um, Poetry, Narrative, Prose, Poems by Piers Ronson. So um, if you think, oh, I'd like to read the rest of it, it's actually available um, in that little book, that little book of poems. Okay. We finished last time by saying, um, it was dark by the time we arrived at Baba Jan. Hassan, the cook, greeted us, boiled fowl and rice for supper. Martha, American archaeology student, showed us to a house in the village and so to bed on a roof of a mud hut. I watched the sun rise over the mountains in reds and golds. The sky faded from black to pale blue to indigo. The villagers left their houses every summer and their black tents and camels were visible across the valley. At breakfast, we met the team, Prof and her deputy Charles. The others were from all over Europe and the States. Annabelle threw her arms around Charles' neck. It seemed they were old friends, both coming from Oxford. I disliked Charles. Days at Babajan were spent unearthing Bronze Age treasures, pots, weapons, jewelry. Annabelle photographed the finds. I drove Hassan to Nurabad for to barter for food, Sam went on digging. We sweated in the hammam, we rode horses, we parted. The party. Charles cornered Annabelle and I saw them kissing in a corner. Sam seemed lonely, so we went back to the house and made love. This story might have had a different ending if the next day Annabelle had not become ill. She collapsed while working on the tepi. It's just a hangover, said Sam. Prof agreed. Annabelle became worse with burning fever and vomiting. I carried her back to the house. She took aspirin and sipped water, but vomited again and again. Prof got into the Land Rover. I'll drive down to Nurabad, the nearest phone, and call Mr. Jasiri in Karamabad. We can't look after her here, but in Karamabad, they're doctors. Jasiri's house is civilized, running water and all that. After 40 miles of bumping along dirt roads, Annabelle was crying, my head, my head. Mr. Jasseri welcomed us to his house. I slipped off my shoes at the door and carried Annabelle into a cool room and laid her on the bed. The doctor visited and diagnosed typhoid fever. I drove to the pharmacy to collect his prescribed drugs. 
Annabelle was delirious. I sponged her down and gave her sips of water. In the evening, I dined with Mr. J and there was no women present. The feast of lamb and rice, then figs and other fruit were welcome after Hassan's humble fare. I slept beside Annabelle on a mattress on the floor. At last, on the fifth day, her fever subsided. I feel disgusting, help me shower, said a small voice. She was as weak as a newborn baby. I pulled her nighty over her head and carried her to the adjacent bathroom, stood under the shower. The water ran over us until all the sweat and grime of days of fever were washed away. You'll be better soon, sugar, I told her. Don't you sugar me, you're not my dad. I knew she was on the mend. Okay, to be continued, I'm afraid. <laughs> great Piers thank you very much <laughs> super okay uh, I'm gonna unpin you uh, gallery site and see everybody okay next up um, Wheezy let's have you unmute uh, yeah Stephanie I wanted to say I really enjoyed that uh, especially the line walking in the languages of the world that really talked to me. <laughs> so, um, and also Ken, we tried that hybrid in Ventura, California, yeah. and it worked really well. We had to go down again, just to regular Zoom, but but it worked really well. Okay, good, so, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this poem I'm going to read, I uh, just recently in the last few years finally found out a little bit about my birth father. So I thought I would do a poem. His name was Howard McFadden. And I will start with the title. There is one thing you can't hide when you're broken inside, John Lennon. At 18, my father loved the dark cities of 1923, chaotic, unbound, steel skeletons, concrete bones, sparring streets in which he roamed, hung with his crew, made plans for the night, jazz, New Orleans blues, Charleston competitions, tangoed with flappers in dingy supper club rooms, speakeasy taboos. Older now, tough, self-possessed, appearing confident in truth, fragile and alone, hard drinker, weaver of tales, Irish blood true. Grift, fast money, high tone tailor suits, running booze for Capone, Milwaukee to Waterloo. Purchased a plane, took farm families high in the air. Five dollars, half hour of thrills. Suddenly life spiraled down. Excitement can only take you so far. Night terrors take the lead. Nothing like the drink to soak him to sleep. Sees his abandoned children in fitful dreams, never measured up to their needs, but he's still in the air of what they breathe. A seeker, a searcher for some relief, including the occult, seance tables and drink. Whoops, I'm getting a call, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uncle Sam Boot Camp, 1941, Battle Fatigue, Guam, 1943. In the end, schizophrenic, alcoholic, heart disease. He was only 52 and death is real and dark and huge. Left two children bereft. Thank you, Wheezy. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Thank you. Uh, okay. Next, I would like to invite um, Christine, please. I hope you can hear me. Um, this is with thanks to Ken and Denny and Mike and Nigel, and it's Wagtail Open Mic. It's like a TV sitcom coffee shop, 
with friendly staff and easy chairs and one or two high stools. There's a mix of poets keen to share words, keen to share, to share thoughts. There's a soft whoosh of brewing coffee and a certain aroma. A young girl reads from her phone, not her own words, she says. It's a put down for an X. It's witty and we laugh. There's a rich tomatoey, herby, foodie smell now. Dishes clatter softly. Denny performs with teapot and union flag on a stick. Tea, the English panacea. It's just a year on from the first words in wagtail windows. We consider how our year has gone, how far we've come. What have we learned? Who would have thought it would come to this? But we're still here, despite COVID and lockdown and testing and isolation. But people have died before we ever thought they would. We worry about wars and knife crime and lost souls at sea. But as Denny said, there's always tea. We find solace in our wagtail evenings and in sharing words out loud with you. Lovely. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much. Um, I think I got everything in there. <laughs> I think you did. I think you did. It was great. <laughs> um, okay. Next, I think I'd like to call on uh, Nigel, please. Hello, everyone. I may have phone before because I cannot find my writings currently. My work is at the publisher because we all seem to be publishing our work. Anyway, this uh, piece is called Gratitude. Gratitude is a state of grace, sadly expressed by too few. Graciousness, sorry, graciousness expressed by even fewer. Are so many people so incomplete? By just offering a few words of gratitude, life could be so sweet. Gratitude and graciousness cost so very little, yet oh so very rewarding. Can people not see how much a better world they could live in? All they need to offer is gratitude, a little, no a lot, of graciousness. Can you imagine all those happy, smiling faces, people happy receiving, having received gratitude, whatever they may have done? Gratitude to the multitude, no wars, just love to everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Next up, please, Elaine. I see you sitting there. You're on. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Um, this is a poem that I wrote for one of my students. It's called Samar of Holmes, Syria. As I sit down to dinner tonight, I wonder if you have enough food to eat or if you languish in a dusty crowded camp, a tin city without amenities, people sick and dying, hopeless. I wonder if you still exist, girl whose name is an amulet of flowers. My dear girl, when you left my classroom, you were thrown back into the whiplash of war, destruction, and diasporas. Where are you now? Your sister, your mother, your family? In the San Fernando Valley, you and your sister, fair white peaches with only a hint of makeup on your creamy skin, no hijabs to hide your thick, tawny hair, were just another pair of valley girls and sweaters and jeans. 
I said, I love the word Damascus, redolent of Paul blinded on that road, of T.E. Lawrence and Gertrude Bell inserting themselves into colonial history. I love to say Damascus, thrilling me with wonder like sapphire, transporting me to blue shores, blue forests. And you and your mother said you would be visiting home soon and invited me along. Such a cozy word, Holmes, so safe and charming. You said we could take a side trip to Damascus. I should have gone with you while it still seemed feasible. Who knew your ripeness would soon end in early marriage to a man requiring you to shroud? I was astounded, but should not have been, had I known more of your family and why you left Syria and why you returned, disappearing into the storm Hassan unleashed on his people. The only records I have of you now are the Syrian dispatches of Marie Colvin from the front and the photos of Holmes bombed to a grid of rubble where she herself died. Amulet of verdure and flowers, sweet winds and solstice fruit, oranges, mangoes, quinces and figs, over 500,000 dead, and 3.8 million refugees. Where are you now, dear girl? Where is your dust? Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Wow. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, um, so let's move on and we will move swiftly on to, I think we'll welcome back Rebecca. Rebecca, welcome back. Where are you? Yeah. There you are. Couldn't see you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I um, I wrote a poem um, which was about um, my choir, and then we were forced to um, sing outside um, due to the regulations um, last year, and um, we actually on our feet because the place we went to was beautiful um, and um, it seemed really surreal to be singing outside as a choir but um, with all the um, unpredictability of singing outside so I wrote this poem and I put it on the, um, the blog um, the um, words of words that loud, loud blog um, and um, I also, um, I read it to my choir later on. So it's called Secret Haven. When I am in the church hall again, I will think back to a time when we came with folders of music and sat on damp, uneven grass with camp chairs and unlimited height of sky over our heads. We sang to the graves and the ancient church behind the flint wall. Tall trees were dark with summer and sometimes a bird would swoop hurry past on its way to roost. Our voices were thin, the keyboard distant. We sang with birdsong and insects that could buzz into our mouths. Sometimes it spat with rain, winged, flapped at our pages under an unreliable tent of sky. Darkness crept in, making shadows deeper, a rising tide of night. I saw the sun descending down a soft staircase of clouds with folds of cumulus, its rays crepuscular silver, bars of light touching the hills from a milk white ball of light. 
In the grey darkness, we turned on torches to read our music, making soft pools of light like glowworms, cold air covering us like a cloak. They said it was unsafe to sing, but how could I feel in danger in that still garden, that secret haven? Thank you, Rebecca. Great to have you back. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, next, I think we'll go with Dennis. Dennis, unmute yourself, please. Yes. You're on. Uh, this poem was written by Rod McQuarrie. He was a real cowboy and he wrote cowboy poetry. This poem is called Mad Jack's Dog. It was a short and squatty cabin, thick dirt roof and round corral. From a distance, it looked interesting. So I stopped to rest my horse for a spell. From around behind the cabin, this wild eyed old timer came. He said he was Mad Jack Hanks. I shook his hand told him my name. He said he was up there trapping beaver and that he had the lonesome blues. Soon he offered bed and breakfast if I'd share the latest news. I agreed to his proposal. He seemed glad to have me stay. He was rustling up some tableware while I put my horse away. He had the supper going while I hauled in a load of wood. I shared the latest current events and things were going good until I reached down to pet his damn old dog. I truly meant no harm, but before you know it, that old wolf bit me on the arm. Now I took it slow and easy, figured I could make us friends cause few dogs resist my true attempt to make amends. But that old wolf just showed his teeth to me and act like he might attack. I finally took the hint, moved my stool around by Jack. Mad Jack, I said, why does your dog just glare at me with hate? Uh, he said, it's nothing. It's just you're eating off his plate. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I don't know where you find them, but they're great. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Next, uh, I think we should welcome to her first visit, and she's told me that she's like to read. So let's welcome Britta. Thank you. So I'm in Scotland, but not in the scenic bit. So there'll be no poems about Ben Nevis or cliff tops. It's just going to be my back garden. <laughs> Lunchtime ritual. Two with wood pigeons, I call them Mr. and Mrs., meet on the bitumen sheets of our shed. Their relationship unstable, rocky at the best of times. Today, I stay verging on volatile, lives are at risk, world peace elusive. On the ground, in the seed covered spot, right under our bird feeder slot, two collared doves, legs stilting, head stilting. I call them Mr. and Mrs. too. And yet what a difference. They pick, they flick, the good into the pot, the bad into the crop, stum, unhurried, civilized. I notice their disapproving look towards the noisy rooftop drama, brings down the tone of the entire neighbourhood, one coots to the other in mock posh disgust. Back garden riffraff, Mr. Dove replies unimpressed, and that is all he'll ever say regarding the matter. Meanwhile, in front of the house, seagulls don't bother with etiquette. There are only so many ways you can fight over the scraps of a guttered fish supper. You see, We've got it all here. Daylight robbery next to the roadside, 
sniggering comments on the state of affairs, domestic disputes fought beak and tail, and within a few yards of my kitchen sink were the robins, the blue tit, and starlings galore dart in and out of my little world, providing the chirpy soundtrack to this play. I ask you, honestly, who needs a book, TV, phone or paper, if you've got a garden full of leaping birds? Thank you. Well done, Britta. Thank you very much and welcome. So I'm sure we'll see you again. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope we do. Uh, right. <clears throat> Um, Sue Shattuck, you are next. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you very much, Stephanie. I thought uh, the poems were beautiful, as have all the poems been tonight. And also um, that I know that bench in, uh, in Westing very well. Um, and it was, it was a lovely poem, that. Um, as some of you know, I've been, I went, to a, uh, went on a cruise um, in December, and I thought I would read one of my poems. I only wrote two poems on my cruise, actually, because I was too busy doing other things. But um, I thought I'd read one of them out to you today so you know how I got on. Um, this one is called, it's called Ballet. Um, and it's December the 9th, 2021, and I was about three days into the cruise. Anyway, as soon as I stepped aboard the ballet, pronounced balletta, it was clear I was in for a treat. I had a lovely, bright, first-class feeling cabin with a balcony that's small, but rather quite sweet. The surface so far is exemplary. The food, well, there is so much for a vegan to eat. And the napkins are all, have all been starched and not just paper. And there's entertainment and a lot of new people to meet. The only downside has been the rather rough weather. We had to swerve away from our first port of call and shelter safe in the Spanish port of Bilbao for two days. Then the then the wind speeds are due for a fall and fingers firmly crossed because I don't like the huge swells of the ocean. Must admit that I've felt extremely seasick. As we sail the dread Bay of Biscay, even on this big ship, the waves packed a kick. It was like climbing a mountain just to get to the loo and hidden things rolled around in the dark. The wind whistled and wailed through a crack in the door and couldn't walk around, but had to find a seat and just park. But that was yesterday. Today, well, I've managed a late breakfast, then lunch on the terrace. Now the sky is dark looming, quite black. There's another storm blowing in and it's raining. Must just hope the weather changes its tack. Cause tonight it's all glitzy glad rags and sparkles. Postponed from last night, I can razzle-dazzle in my bubble of five. A mixed bunch of born-again cruisers. It's like, come dine with me. For two weeks, will I survive? Don't know. I expect so. They're an interesting um, mix. Three are teachers, and there is one who defies any mould. But they're all perfectly nice dining companions, and it's just dinner. It's not to have and to hold. And so we'll just have to see how it progresses. And so that's all for today. You're updated. I'm enjoying my time on board this incredible ship. Except for the extreme rocking and rolling, I'll sign off now, over and out, toodle pip. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Thank you very much. Um, Great pleasure. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> uh... Chris, I see you're with us. Are you? Uh, do you have something to read? I can read. Yes, I'd like to read a poem, please. Okay. Would you like to read now, or do you need time to get it together? Yes. No. I, I've been. I've been here for the last twenty minutes or so. Good. Okay. Listen to everybody, and it's great. And I Excellent. also heard most of Stephanie's as well. All of it, in fact, except for the very last bit. 
Okay, uh, this is this is from my uh, collection, Key to the Highway. Um, it's published by Shoestring, uh, and this poem is about and for my mother, who was in the navy in uh, in Portsmouth in World War Two, and she's still alive now in her late nineties, a widow, living on her own in Shropshire. Holding the line. Her father was a sailor who sought the shortest route. Her seamstress mother sewed a neat straight hem. She fitted gyroscopes that made torpedoes run a fast white line and raised two kids when that was done. She knows time to the minute, when to rise, when to eat, when to go out. If the gardener is late, she is afraid. The clock goes quiet each afternoon. She watches light in the tree outside that, as it fades, alerts the ticking in each room to start the habits of the night. Wash, dress, wine, a narrow bed. She calls to say, don't feel you have to visit this old woman, her diary plans her fate. She cannot read her ticked off past and walks quickly to her next appointment. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you. Okay, I think it's time for Jean. There you are. Hi, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a wonderful morning in California. Stephanie, thank you. Your poems were really um, got me thinking a lot. You, and um, I'm going to really read a very short poem. As many of you may know, I was a professional modern dancer with Martha Graham. and even got once to dance with the uh, Sadler's Wells before it was the Royal Ballet. This is about dance culture. And um, we didn't have a lot of money, but we put it in dance clothes and dance bags, purses. And this is about, uh, the title is Big Dance Bags. The chubbier, the better, is the dancer's status symbol to find some showstopper purse. When you enter a dressing room, the eagle eyes spot check. Where'd you get that standout purse? The generous kiss and tell, the prideful, smirk but like but it's like many a dancer's quest to find that standout purse <laughs> thank you jean thank well, you so much this is wonderful uh -huh. thank you all okay and it's time for who's it time for tina uh, the other Tina, Christina. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for the lovely poems. They're very moving. And also Stephanie, I love the nature references. Um, I think we're going to have a change of mood because mine's quite lighthearted. Um, I wrote it really for Sawain, for Halloween because I walked in the woods, which I love, with somebody that didn't enjoy them. Um, so it's called The Woods. Don't go into the woods today. It's wet and muddy. The leaves are falling and the brambles scratch, leaving blood red marks. Don't go into the woods today. It's cold and frosty, the branches bare, 
and the fox is hungry, searching for a meal. Don't go into the woods today, it's warm and sunny. The trees are in life, in leaf, and but the paths are dark, telling you to retreat. Don't go into the woods today, for the sun is setting and the evening cools. Shadows begin to creep behind your back. But I went into the woods today along the winding track to laugh and play with the little folk who led me astray. And now I am a bag of bones lying on the ground, turning moss green in the wet, never to be found. Thank you, Tina. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Mike, it's you. Hello, thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody for reading tonight and, and particularly thank you to Stephanie, your poem's incredible. Um, I, I think my favorite is um, uh, last night, I dreamed that once all fields had names. It's just incredible, <laughs> really amazing, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was gonna read a poem that I wrote a while ago, um, uh, called, which is kind of like a play on the Dylan Thomas poem. And I've called it Go Gently Into That Good Night. Um, but I'm not sure I will read that. So I found something else that's very similar um, in a way. Um, and this is called You Are The Prayer Now. Um, so just recently, I, I heard that a very good friend, a very dear friend and, and mentor um, died um, in... Um, in America at the beginning of January. So we're just sort of getting news of that coming through now. Um, but this person taught me a great many things about um, uh, life and, and, and death. So this is, you are the prayer now. Yes, there is sickness here and pain and suffering, old age and death. The world is full of weeping, of sorrow, and of horror and yes my dear sweet child there are monsters in the hearts of men and of women too and even so i say to thee they are no match for the arms of my infinity for the ocean of forever or the fact of your divinity into which you will fall and be held and waking see that all indeed shall so be well, that you will be the prayer we need. When walking through the flames of hell with heart ablaze in loving light, the night will lose its cloak of dark and in the quiet you shall softly sing. Hark, the dawn will come in all these things. Thanks, mate. Uh, okay. Thanks, Mike. So um, I was going to read one. Uh, if there, anybody else wants to read who hasn't read, please say. Otherwise, okay. All right. Well, it seems it's interesting, isn't it, that um, we seem to have had a um, a glut of publishing, which is brilliant. So everybody's reading from their collections, which is fantastic. So congratulations to everybody. Um, and last time at Wagtail, I said I'd got something published in a, a magazine. Um, and I read one of them um, and I'm going to read another one tonight. So this is also just recently been published in, in a magazine. Uh, in, what's it called? Poetry Quarterly. Uh, okay, this is about, um, we lived for a while in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and Arizona's funny, certainly Scottsdale was, or Phoenix. They have this thing, this feature in the summer, um, sort of at the end of the day at five-ish. It's a five minute monsoon. So um, it absolutely hurls down with rain and people walk out onto the balconies to watch it. It's a, it's a thing and then it disappears. Um, and then it's back to being 115 degrees again. So this is the Scottsdale tone poem. From my balcony, I watch the mountains trying to stare me down again. Sometimes snow topped, sometimes 
sun-kissed, always glowering, brooding, watching. Today, rain-drenched, illuminated by lightning, surrounded by that electric phosphorescent glow. The five minute monsoon slashes the darkness with tributaries of light, sheets of incandescence. Fires crackling rounds of suppressed electric discharge around the hemisphere of my hearing. An aurora in miniature that draws me to the edge pulls me in and disappears, just as I think I understand it. So there you are, there we are. Um, well, everybody, wonderful to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you again, Stephanie. You can unmute yourselves, by the way, if you want to um, chat. So please do. But it's wonderful to see you all. Stephanie, a fantastic reading. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you um, all so much. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you, everybody else. It's wonderful. It's wonderful mm. um, to still be able to be doing this. Um, uh, and, you know, Zoom is okay. It's not, you know, it's not, we're not in person, but here we are. Mm. So it's great. Um, and I love, we love hearing the richness of people from you know many different backgrounds and cultures and places so it's it's really quite special this zoom certainly special to me so thank you so much and see you in february if we don't see you anywhere else along the way before then thanks again everyone bye Take lovely care. to meet you okay bye bye everybody bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye.